happy Monday, and welcome back to the Lord and Arts channel. I'm John Lord. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today. Case Cracked is the show where we look into a mystery, and what are the critical pieces that help solve that mystery? On today's episode, we're looking into a big screen bad guy who's also a real life bad guy. In his book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, Rabbi Harold Kushner tells us that, quote, we could bear nearly any pain or disappointment if we thought there was a reason behind it, a purpose to it. Those reasons can help us move through the immense emotions of the situation on our path to becoming a survivor. And no one knows this more than Victoria. Now, Victoria is not her real name. She's never been publicly identified, but what is public is her story of resilience. On Christmas Eve, 1990, in California, 19-year-old Victoria spent the night out with friends looking at the Christmas lights that decorated their town. At about 12.30 a.m., the group split up and Victoria made her way home with her puppy, Chassis. As she walked into her apartment complex and neared her front door, a man approached her. He said, excuse me, I'm lost. Can you help me find where the beach is? Before she could answer, a second man came up behind her and slammed into her back as the man in front of her did the same. The man in front of her pulled a gun and hit her in the head. He told her he was going to kill her, mutilate her, and throw her from the cliffs. As she tried to fight off the man in front of her, her dog, Chassis, bit the man's wrist, startling him and the man behind her, and Victoria had a free moment to escape. As she ran, she tossed little Chassis into some nearby bushes, fearing the puppy would be killed otherwise. She didn't get very far before her hair was grabbed from behind and she was thrown into the backseat of a car. She now had a clear sight of both of her attackers. One man appeared to be Hispanic and the other Asian. As the pair drove around, they tried to get Victoria to give them directions to any cliffs in the area. Knowing this would be the place that she died, she told the men that there were no cliffs in the area. Trying to garner sympathy from the men, she lied and told them that she had a baby, pleading with them to just let her go. The men pulled up to a beach, and the Asian man told Victoria to undress. As she did, he said, I needed a beach girl for my Christmas present to myself. For what felt like hours, Victoria was sexually assaulted and tortured. Soon, she was questioning if she would rather die than let these assaults continue. The Asian man took his gun and started to slowly count the bullets it held while putting it to her head. She knew this was her final chance and pleaded again to be let go. Surprisingly, she felt that she must have reached the Hispanic man emotionally because he insisted on just that. The men then tied her blue jeans around her eyes and made her start walking. As she walked away, naked, she heard the Asian man say, By the way, Merry Christmas. Run. She was soon found in the yard of people who lived in the area, and police were called. When she was examined at a hospital in Huntington Beach where she was found, doctors discovered that she had red marks on her eyes from the Asian man's nails. It appeared that he actually tried to gouge them out before the bite from chassis. Part of the hinge in her jaw had been dislodged and most of her teeth were very loose. She also had lost a significant amount of blood and her hearing was also damaged. Her body was covered in cuts and bruises and the sexual assault had left her in extreme pain. Before she was released to her family, a sexual assault kit was administered and more evidence was collected, including samples of blood found on her, her nails and samples from her clothes. When she was released, she went into hiding at her grandmother's house in Huntington Beach. Virginia eventually sat with investigators and helped them come up with a composite sketch of each of her attackers, which were then released to the public. They also had found DNA evidence, two male profiles. On her body, one of the men had carved SOS. Victoria had heard her attackers say, show the respect to Sons of Samoa. At that time, the SOS was a faction of the Crips gang and was known to have a very violent reputation. 
Even though investigators had no license plate number, witnesses other than Victoria or fingerprints, they initially expected to catch the perpetrators easily. They worked the gang connection angle of the case for about a year before giving up on it. There were no rumors on the street, no gang intel, and no calls came in from those sketches. Deciding that it must have been a false lead, they started over. As years started to pass, Victoria became more and more withdrawn. The attack left her with severe PTSD. She no longer smiled, could not sleep at night. Knowing she had to do something to change her situation, she decided to move out of state and start her life over. Slowly, her mental health improved, and eventually her days took on some sense of normalcy. Finally, she no longer thought about the attack daily and started to associate more and more with the people around her. That was when she decided to call an old friend of hers. When he came for a visit, he never left. The two were married and would go on to have four children, including one set of twins. Victoria was happy and secure in her new life, until one day in 2008, when it all came rushing back to her. 18 years after her brutal attack, investigators called to tell her that they had found a match to the DNA samples taken, but they needed her to come into the department to look at photo lineups. When she arrived, she was shown a series of pictures. She was quickly able to identify one of the men, and she was told his name was Joseph Hyung Min Sun, or Joe Sun. The five foot, four inch, 230 pound South Korean was known for his MMA fighting and UFC appearances, but was never able to make a career of it. His biggest claim to fame came in 1997 when he would wind up in a major movie. In Austin Powers, International Man of Mystery, he played Dr. Evil's henchman, Random Task, a spoof of the character Odd Job from the James Bond films. Son, was convicted of felony vandalism for kicking in the door of a roommate's car. He was offered a plea deal that would leave him with just probation if he submitted his DNA. Sun was arrested on October 7, 2008 and charged with 17 counts of various sexual assault charges. When he was questioned, he denied ever knowing Victoria or participating in her assault. Fortunately, a confession was not needed, as the officers had her visual identification and those DNA samples. There was just one loose end to tie up. They still needed to find her other attacker. It was decided that a bulletin would be put out that pictured Sun and the composite of the other attacker to see if he was recognized. And that did the trick. Soon, investigators received a tip that said their man was 40-year-old Santiago Gaitan. When they looked into the man's past, they found that Gaitan had a short criminal history, moved out of state, and now had a wife and children. In order to verify the anonymous tip, a DNA sample would be needed to compare to the 1990 evidence sample. Huntington Beach officers traveled to his home and set up surveillance at the apartment complex Gaitan lived in. At one point, he threw a soda bottle away in a dumpster, and investigators were able to retrieve it along with the rest of his trash. Samples taken from the bottle were a match to the 1990 sample, and in early 2009, Gaitan was arrested. Gaitan pled guilty to four felony counts of differing sexual assaults, plus another of kidnapping, and was sentenced to 17 years and four months in prison. Sun pled not guilty to the 17 felony sexual offenses. If found guilty, he could have served up to 275 years in prison. Unfortunately, before the trial commenced, the prosecution realized that the statute of limitations had run out on all but two of the sexual assault charges. Everyone was determined for Victoria to see justice and decided that Sun would be tried on charges of torture and conspiracy to commit murder, which have no statute of limitations and carry a hefty sentence. Sun's trial started August 25, 2011. Victoria took the stand and told the court every detail of her attack in an amazing show of bravery that anyone could appreciate. Sun never testified. But as Victoria talked, he frequently yelled, that's a lie, they're making this up. On September 19th, after only a few hours of deliberation, a jury convicted Joe Sun on one count of felony torture and 
he was sentenced to seven years to life in prison. One month into his sentence, Sun's cellmate was found beaten to death in their cell. Prosecutors immediately thought of Victoria and asked if she would testify at his second trial to drive home to the judge just how vicious Sun was. As she debated whether or not she had the strength for another retelling of her abduction, Victoria was diagnosed with advanced breast cancer. She would eventually win the fight, her cancer going into remission, but it also left her unable to testify. At this trial, Sun actually admitted to the assault and beating of Victoria, saying it was the worst decision of his life. For the new charge of manslaughter, he was found guilty and received an additional sentence of 27 years. Although Victoria has now found justice for her attack, she still suffers its effects and likely will for the rest of her life. To the court, she said, quote, I feel debilitating fear come over me and I'm convinced a hand is coming from my behind again. My emotional scars are intense. My 20s were stripped from my life as I relearned how to walk, see, hear, and cope with the outside world again. Joseph's son not only cost me my job at my salon, but also my college savings, not to mention the impact it's made on celebrating Christmas year after year. Victoria is now a grandmother. We know she will continue working towards happiness and finding her own personal peace, and we're thankful that she's made a family that can continue to support her in that journey. Case Cracked I would like to thank eOnline.com, CBS News, Daily Beast, Bakersfield.com, OC Register, LA Times Blogs, Psychology Today, and Today.com. Of course, the biggest thank you goes to Christy Arnhart for researching and writing up today's case, and here she is to discuss it with us now. All right, Christy, I think the first thing on a lot of people's minds with this case, what happened to our little four-legged hero, Chassis? Well, according to a post-sentencing release issued by the Orange County District Attorney's Office, her dog was never found. But in a four, in the 48 hour special that they did, she said that the dog helped police find her and calls it by name, Chassis. But this also opens up two versions of how she was found. And most articles say she came across a house and was discovered that way. But, you know, there are some discrepancies. Yeah, I don't know how, like just with the story as we know it, how do, how would the dog play into the police looking for her? Like how would the police know to be looking for her? And then know that that dog would be related to her. Like, it just, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I looked into it as well. Several of the articles I saw made it seem like she came across the house. So it's mm -hmm. kind of interesting. I don't know, but I know if uh, if anyone else in this story deserves a good life, it's Shassi. And I'm just I'm hopeful that that's how the universe played out for her. Oh, yes. Um, one of the things that really struck me when I saw this story initially was the possibility that she might have seen her attacker in Austin Powers. That movie came out only seven years later, was a big hit. It's one of those movies that people watched time and time again. Like I'd go over to my friend's house, it would just be on. And then of course that's before the television runs. I mean, that thing just got played like crazy. I mean, it's pretty rare for me to remember. There's a f like a handful of movies when, where I can remember the first time seeing them, like going to the mm -hmm. theater and seeing them. Austin Powers totally one of them. Um, so it just it's so bizarre to me that she had such such a strong recollection. I mean, we could see the photo. She the composite's pretty strong. Mm -hmm. And we know in the photo lineup, she picks the guy out. Yeah. So it's just bizarre to me that there's a chance, and who knows if she I mean, maybe she didn't see it or something. I don't know. But there's a mm -hmm. chance that she could have been sitting watching that movie and all of a sudden the dude's face pops up right in front of her. I can't imagine what that would be like. Yeah. And see, she told the press, I have this movie sitting on my rack. I remember running over there and just destroying it because I thought, are you serious? He's in my house. So she I, had a copy. She mm -hmm. literally had a copy of it as well. Wow. Yeah. So maybe it was something that the kids watched and it was too kooky for her. Maybe. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, and admittedly, you know, they're dressing him up like that character from the James Bond film. So that's true. Maybe that's enough of a difference. I mean, I'm sure that's 
nowhere near what he looked like uh, when he approached them. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. in the movie, they've got him in a suit and he's got a hat that he's throwing. And you know, I don't I, think he speaks in the movie either, does he? I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. See, that would be another thing that would alert her. So, yeah, you can miss this. And it's super brief. Like, like his, there's just shots of him that are a few seconds. Um, mm-hmm. I think he's a little part of one action segment, but that's about it. It's not, it's not a whole lot. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. It's insane. Uh, there is a crazy twist with those charges also. And the fact that one attacker, we have guy Tan, uh, who gets a seemingly a bigger sentence than Joe son, like how it, it's so strange, the sentencing around this case and then hitting that thing where all of a sudden, Oh no, the, you know, the statute of limitations ran up. We can't file these 15 charges that we wanted to throw his way. It's just horrific. Yeah. Yeah, well, absolutely. the statute of limitations on rape has got to be amended. It just has to. She deserves justice for everything she went through. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I actually looked into it a little bit because um, I, I agree. And I was curious about why that statute's there in the first place. I came across a legal website that said, in general, statute of limitations are put in place, well, for several reasons. But some of the reasoning is because getting a fair trial would no longer be possible because the evidence would have degraded or witnesses could have passed away or things like that. But we're we're talking about a pretty short time frame. I think in California, it was 10 years, if I recall correctly, for that statute of limitations. Um, but I was really shocked to learn that it's basically a crapshoot depending on what state that you live in. Mm-hmm. Thankfully, that is changing and most of our states in this country at this point have removed the statute of limitations for rape or the ones that haven't fully removed it there's special conditions that if the evidence is tied to dna that that overrides the statute of limitations that basically because to those points about why a statute's there in the first place if you have dna you can still prove the case you don't even need the people to be alive anymore we're seeing that with tons of historical cases Mm -hmm. um also super shocked i found one article it was a little older minnesota state i live in um previously had a statute of limitations i think that was only three years oh my then pushed it to kind of six years um and there's this weird condition where but it's only three years from when it's reported so it almost could shorten up the time frame in some bizarre way Mm -hmm. thankfully uh literally taking effect next month is a new law that is removing the statute of limitations. The downside is it's only going to take effect for crimes that occur after that goes into effect. So crimes that occurred before this, they're still going to hold up to those old rules. I'm thankful there's a change though. And there was, there's people that worked really hard to make that change happen. Um, But thankfully I think that actually nudges the count to about 30 States, possibly a few more uh, that have now removed it. Well, we have to start somewhere. Yeah. And that is a start. But this case highlights a clear example that survivors are dealing with this for the rest of their lives. Yeah. You know, yeah. why should the perpetrators not have to do the same? You know, son showed no remorse for what he did to Victoria. All he said is that it was a big mistake. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really, really good point. Yeah, it's a big mistake from his perspective, right? Of sitting in jail going, oh, I wish I didn't do this. He's, yeah, he's not, just terrible. Yeah, I'm sure he's not sent a letter or tried to get in communication directly to her about, you know, I, I know what I did was terrible. I should have never done it to you or or anything, you know, humane oh. or along those lines. But, oh, well, goodness. Thank you so much for all your hard work on this, Christine. We've got some other people to thank right now. Thank you. PayPal supporters Jennifer Dixon, Amanda M. Beard, and Melissa Heinbach. If you'd like to support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com. There, you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee, like Miss L recently did. We know that learning about the mechanisms that help support and find justice in these cases is so important to understand the many unsolved cases we also cover, and we really appreciate your support in allowing us to continue doing that. Remember, You can get another Lord and Art story every week on the Seriously Mysterious podcast. A new episode is coming tomorrow and every Tuesday after that. Visit SeriouslyMysterious.com and remember to subscribe on your favorite podcatchers. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell icon below if you'd like to catch one of our weekly secret studio live shows. And of course, I'll be back with a new Unsolved Mystery for you on Friday right here on the Lord and Art's channel.